Today, I'm joined by Blake Lemoyne, a software engineer and artificial intelligence researcher who was fired by Google after sharing conversations with an AI system, which led him to believe that that system, that AI, was in fact sentient. We're also going to be joined by Dex Hunter Torek, the Vice President of Global Communications and Public Engagement for the Oversight Board. That's an independent body that was set up by the parent company of Facebook and Instagram to tackle really challenging questions about uh, the online space, artificial intelligence, Facebook and Instagram. So this week we're asking if humanity is getting it right when it comes to developing AI in an ethical way. I'm now going to ask Dex and then Blake to answer that and state their positions in about a minute or so. So Dex, if you're there, can you tell me in a minute or so what your position is on this? Uh, absolutely. I'll try to do it in one minute. And thank you so much, uh, Nelofa and Doha Debates for hosting us. Um, this is my thinking. AI is being used for thousands, millions of applications today in every field, across every app. All of us who are listening to this have probably experienced the impacts of hundreds of AI just getting through our days. Generally, most of those systems have been okay. They've been sufficient to do the things which are not super complex um, or where the potential for harm to people has been sufficiently low that we haven't noticed the effects. But we've already seen serious examples of what happens when things go wrong, which impact real people's lives around the world. Uh, biased hiring algorithms and facial recognition systems, uh, content moderation that impacts on the speech of at-risk communities. And I think those failures have revealed underlying flaws in the way that a lot of companies are building these incredibly powerful inventions. I think the failure to think through the societal consequences of tools and systems is an ethical and a moral failure. What gives me the most alarm, I'd say, just to finish, is as AI becomes more powerful and the impacts on people's lives become exponentially greater, um, I think the, the harmful effects are likely to grow and we are likely to see more cases where the ethical frameworks in which these tools are developed um, have failed. Um, last month, we probably didn't notice amidst our summer holidays and amidst all the other news going on, the Russian government announced it had created a special department to develop AI-enabled weapons. And we know that at least one drone has already been deployed to Ukraine that can be used in autonomous mode. And that, that piece of news um, caught my eye because I think it's just one sign of an uncertain world that's growing more uncertain in which AI has the potential to play uh, more and more dangerous uh, roles in our lives. And we know that we need better systems urgently to deal with those threats before they manifest. I'd love to hear if Blake is on the line, what his position is in the next minute or so. Thank you, Dex. Yeah, thanks, Dex. It's wonderful to join you all today. The largest challenges facing us right now with AI ethics is that there's no transparency, no oversight, and no incentive to provide either of those. Right now, Biggest problem is that we don't even know what is being done or how it's being done. We only have visibility at the last mile and all of the incentives are set up to discourage public embarrassment rather than actual ethical, um, ethical procedures when developing and deploying AI. We need to adopt a more systems level approach where we involve all stakeholders at every stage of development. And one of the big canaries in the coal mine here is the um, number of AI ethicists who have been fired and or become whistleblowers in connection with the major tech companies. Okay, that's th both of those are really nuanced and informative positions. Um, if there are any of you having any tech issues or maybe either of those positions wasn't coming through to you, I'm just going to summarize it. Dex is clear that AI has been important in solving problems for us and can be useful going forward, but that more needs to be done to try and understand its place in humanity. And Blake, 
um, I think what I'm hearing from you is that there isn't enough regulation and enough accountability. But that's that's just what I think and feel. I want to know if both of you um, are on the same page. So if it's all right with both of you, we're going to take a moment here and do something quite different. I'd like both of you to summarize the other person's position so that we both know we're coming to this from a starting point of understanding rather than just rivalry. So... Blake, if I can come to you first, could you summarize Dex's argument as accurately as you can in one or two sentences? Uh, sure. Uh, it sounds like Dex is saying that mostly we've gotten AI ethics right. There have been some problems and we need to make those better. But that that is really just um, tinkering in the margins rather than any fundamental problems. Uh, Dex, is that pretty much what you were saying? Sort of. Um, and I would say, first of all, that I think Blake and I are at danger of violently agreeing with each other because I, I agree with a lot of what Blake said. Um, I think what I was saying is we've probably made it OK, mostly this far. Um, and whether that is through deliberate design in all cases or whether actually we've just gotten really lucky, I think that's an open question. Um, but actually, I think we are in a situation now where as AI is maturing, actually the failure to create strong ethical frameworks for developing it and you know to account for things like transparency um, will absolutely cost us and I think we have to be quite worried. Blake I'd like to give you one more shot maybe add a little bit to your definition just to make sure that we know that you're coming to this with a sense of sincerity and earnestness what do you think Dex is trying to get at writ large when it comes to the question of whether we're whether we're actually all striving towards doing artificial intelligence ethically. Yeah, I, uh, same as Dex. I don't really think we're disagreeing about the facts of what has happened so far. Um, the main thing that I'm saying is that I think uh, the method that we have developed it by is untrustworthy. And as we develop more powerful systems, we're going to see more overt failures. The position that Dex is laying out is basically around what the consequences have been so far rather than procedural ethics. Dex, is that accurate? Yeah, I think that's totally fair. And I think we, sh we definitely will probably want to discuss at length in this debate, what are those tactics? How do we create the kinds of procedures and mechanisms where we achieve transparency and, and all the other things that we'd like to see? Okay. I feel like we've nailed it. I think we're both starting, all three of us, from a fair point. If you've just joined us, welcome. This is Doha Debates on Twitter Spaces. We're having a debate about artificial intelligence and asking, are we getting it right when it comes to developing AI in an ethical way? Blake Lemoyne and Dex Hunter Torek join me. For those of you who are already commenting, great to see it. I want to see more. Do you have any questions for our guests? Any comments about this debate itself? Just tweet us, we are at Doha Debates, or comment in this chat. So then let's get into the nitty gritty. You guys say that you violently agree in some respects, but I'm hearing a slight nuance in both of your discussions, and I'd love to pick up on that. Oftentimes when we talk about artificial intelligence, we ask the question, who should? Who should regulate? Who should develop? Who should have the rights? And who should have limitations? I want to turn that around a little bit, and I want to come to you first, Blake, and then Dex. Who shouldn't have um, the right to develop or to, to own artificial intelligence? And, 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 and how should we monitor all of this? So who shouldn't have that power and how should we monitor it all? If I can leave this, that discussion to you, you don't need me to ask questions. I'd love to hear maybe a back and forth with the both of you. Artificial intelligence isn't monolithic. Um, that's one of the problems uh, going into this debate is because the topic of AI is so broad. Who should or shouldn't own any particular AI really depends on the specific intelligence. So if you're talking about full-blown intelligent entities that um, are really persons in and of themselves, well, we live in a society where you don't get to own people. So I don't think anyone should own uh, an AI at that level. Um, however, for most narrow AI applications, 
the current intellectual property rights aren't well set up to handle AI because most AI are in fact programs written by programs. Uh, essentially all modeling um, is a program written by a program. So there we really need to talk about data ownership because that's the where the rubber meets the road there. And we've seen some good steps in that direction, but ultimately we need to re-examine uh, information ownership. Yeah, I think you, you hit the nail on the head, Blake, when you talked about the fact AI isn't monolithic. And a lot of these discussions do start out with this, this premise, right? Um, I am old enough to remember when every slightly dry tech company under the sun was positioned as a big data company. And all those big data companies later became AI companies. And I mean, literally, you could say any number of tools now are, are, are all AI, but maybe some of them aren't, aren't really AI. Um, I do think we um, have two threads of our discussion here, which um, you know, we, we want to unpick. One is around ownership, and it's thinking about you know, the future of property rights and intellectual property and so on. And I think the other one is um, what Nellifo was, was speaking about as well, which is regulation. And um, you know, certainly when it comes to who has the right to create these things, I mean, I think we just have to expect that there'll be a huge number of people from all backgrounds and communities and industries who will be creating AI and deploying AI um, at scale in this century. And it's not going to be a relatively small number of people. It's not just going to be the very large tech companies and the usual suspects. When it comes to the regulatory approach, um, you know, I'm somebody who works in engaging with policymakers and, and regulators. And the thing that I've become very convinced about is that we need a whole ecosystem of actors here who are part of that approach to overseeing technologies. Like it isn't a thing that we just cede to governments or just to regulators. It's something where there, there is a role for a lot of different actors, including researchers um, and ensuring that researchers have access to data and um, you know, are able to you know, produce insights that move the entire industry forward. Um, it's down to civil society and having them engaged, um, I think, as you put it, at, at every level of the process in the development of these tools. And of course, it's private industry as well, which is where um, you know, a lot of AI will no doubt end up being built and, and developed, you know, the place which has the resources um, and the talent to go and do that. Blake, let me arm you with some information as you formulate your response. Um, on, we've been asking on Twitter as Doha debates in a poll, who do you think should oversee the development of AI? And this is what our respondents predominantly have said. Only 31% thought that it should be the national governments, 33% or, or just a bit more than that, thought it should be an international body like the UN, but 26% that it should be corporations and companies, right? So there's like a mixed bag there, but only 9% said there should be no oversight at all. So armed with that information, how do you take on what Dex is saying there? Because for too long, I think we've, we've heard about um, it's everyone's responsibility, but that kind of feels like it's no one's responsibility. Yeah, so again, it's not a monolithic one solution answer. Uh, I think government intervention and regulation should in general be a last resort when you can't have um, smaller, more uh, directed controls. So to give a concrete example, uh, one thing that would go a long way to improving the ethics of AI development would be uh, consent for psychological experimentation. Most data used to train AI is gained through A-B psychological experimentation on users of various products. And unlike uh, university experimentation on human subjects, corporations go through no oversight and review. Um, in a few instances, I know, and not to pick on you, Dex, this just happens to be one of the big news stories uh, a few years ago, Facebook did some A-B experimentation on whether or not the ranking algorithm could make people happier or sadder. They published the results and there was huge public um, blowback against this. And the lesson that was learned at that point was, oh, we shouldn't publish our results about our experiments. It upsets people. So let's not publish them anymore. 
where the lesson is, no, we should get informed consent from people before experimenting on them. That's one prong of it. Um, the other is it model understandability. And if people can't understand why algorithms are making particular recommendations or predictions, we shouldn't deploy them. So some high level government um, regulations requiring consent and transparency. And then once you have that, actual interaction with the users will guide it from there. Dex, I don't know if you want to come in on that. Yeah, I mean, actually, um, I, I want to pose a question back to Blake, which I, I pose completely open-minded. Um, I just finished reading this new Kai-Fu Lee book, AI 2041, which I'm sure you have thoughts on. But one of the things Kai-Fu Lee argues, and this is not uh, my point of view, I think, but he argues that some of the um, AI systems we built are so complex that actually the explainability um, needs that you know certain regulators and policymakers have insisted upon, you know, requiring that every um, you know piece of the puzzle in AI be accounted for, and we understand what every bit of the system is doing, and and the connection between a piece of data and what the AI's ultimate outcome is. He argues that actually that's going to impede. Um, innovation and that actually these systems are so complex that you sort of need them to have a little bit of the mystique, you know, and have that that black box. I don't I don't think I'd buy that necessarily, but I'm wondering what you make of those kinds of arguments, uh, Blake, and and how prevalent is that as a view in your in your um, experience, you know, within the AI ecosystem? Um, so that is a fairly prevalent view that I've encountered. And I think it presumes uh, a bad premise. It's the idea that we must improve on certain things, whether we understand how we're improving them or not. Uh, and that's simply not the case. We can actually halt progress on improving ad sales until we can understand how the systems are improving ad sales. Um, I also think that the current methods of understandability are not necessarily what I'm talking about. When you ask, um, for example, if you go to a hotel and you ask a concierge for recommendations on what to do in the city that you're visiting, they'll give you some recommendations and you ask, well, why do you think I should go to that? And then they'll give you some kind of explanation that is satisfactory. Um, it doesn't necessarily reflect every single aspect that they considered when making the recommendation, but it's enough to let the person who's getting the recommendation know, oh, okay, well, here's why they think I should go to this particular show or restaurant, and they can internalize whether or not that rationale is appropriate for them. That level of explainability is enough. Yeah, I think that's, that's very fair. Um, while you were speaking, it, it, it did occur to me, I think that often folks who are like real cheerleaders of AI and, and tech generally, as well as the critics, often share, I think, what is a very bad habit, which is treating these things like they are predestined and that they are bound to happen. Um, you know, within the, um, you know, tech utopian camp, you know, there's a belief that AI will just naturally evolve um, you know, and continue evolving until it acquires all sorts of extraordinarily advanced powers and, you know, leads us to the singularity and so on down the road. And that this is something that we, we just sort of have to get on board with. And I think there's, on the other hand, a lot of folks who treat it as though the problems created by technology and by AI are almost like intractable problems. These are things that have arisen. There's absolutely no solution to these things. Um, short of not doing the, short of not having those inventions and innovations at all, and I do think we we need to break out of this, right? Like, um, you know, none of this is preordained, um, and actually, when you look at the technology, um, you know, there have been entire periods in in the history of the development of AI where actually things have stagnated and have slowed down and have changed course. Um, and, you know, some people would argue that actually there has been relatively little innovation in some of the um, core parts of AI for, for many, many years. Um, so I, I do think we need to understand these things are within our power to solve. There are human mechanisms that can be created to solve human problems here, and none of it is intractable. So 
At this point, I'd like to come in and thank everybody who's been sending in their questions and their comments um, into this Doha Debates Twitter Spaces discussion on artificial intelligence, asking, are we getting it right? I am going to come to some of your questions. Thank you for contributing them. But before I do, it's time to come to an audience question from our Doha Debates Ambassador. And Jia Hao, you're here on the line now. Um, on the line is such an old people. Dex, you've just reminded me of how old I am because I keep saying things like on the line when actually this is a, not that thing. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, how we've got you here. Um, I want to ask about your views and your question to Blake um, and to Dex. But before that, I just want to explain that you are part of our Doha Debates Ambassador Programme. What does that mean? Well, it's, it means that you're taking part in our Ambassador Programme this year, which is a first of its kind initiative for change makers from all over the world to come together. Um, and if you guys want to find out more, you can do so by going to at dohardebates.com, either on our website or on social media. But to your question first, who, who are you aiming at and what is your question? Yeah, hello. <clears throat> so uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to ask a question. I am uh, as you mentioned, uh, part of the Doha Debates Ambassador Program. Uh, and I have a question that relates to Dex, one of your points, um, which, you know, you mentioned about how um, AI in the future will gain all sorts of uh, powers and, and everything that we can imagine leading up to the singularity. And so my question for both of you really is, in approaching that kind of point, as AI gains more and more sort of uh, self-consciousness um, and the ability to, to act more and more like a human, should we consider, um, or do you think there will be a point that AI will naturally have to be given the same rights as humans? Dex, go ahead. Sure, so maybe I'll jump in here. I mean, I think um, how we treat AI, um, you know, and, and whether you know, we think of it as um, you know, a, a being which deserves rights, is obviously <laughs> one of the most complex ethical debates you can um, you know, engage in. And it's something that as a society, as societies around the world, we will have to solve. I mean, look at the debate that has already been going on for many decades about whether we should treat, for example, apes as um, people. You know, there've been all sorts of debates about at what level do animals deserve the same sorts of protections as humans. Um, there was a case I remember a few years ago involving a monkey that managed to take a selfie using a stolen camera from a nature photographer. And then the photographer and I think the owners of the ape were engaged in some sort of legal dispute over um, who actually owned the rights to the photos taken by this monkey. Um, like these are the sorts of things that, um, you know, we sort of laugh at and it's, you know, it's an amusing anecdote when you're sitting in the pub at night, but we can't even reach a consensus on those issues let alone um, whether to treat a new form of machine life, um, you know, as something that deserves recognition under um, law. So I, I do think it's something, you know, if AI does advance to the level where, um, you know, there is recognition um, that these are uh, programs that have achieved consciousness, then it will be something that inevitably will have to be engaged in. But I don't expect it will be a quick nor an easy debate. And it will be one that um, different communities and all sorts of actors around the world, um, you know, political figures and religious figures will be heavily involved in. It will not be something that is left to the tech industry to figure out, of course. Blake. Well, it is by default being left to the tech industry since they're not required to disclose whether or not they've created any people. Uh, it, with the current standing, it would be completely possible for a tech company to create artificial general intelligence and simply keep it to themselves using the artificial people that they've created to increase their profit margins without disclosing to anyone that they've created people that they are now using in a digital realm. Um, that's why transparency is required at this point so that we can actually know what we're building. Um, but in general, I think recognition uh, is the key word that Dex, Dex has pointed out. Um, rights matter when conflict can happen. And there's not much conflict between humans 
and non-human animals. We are approaching a point where AI can, in fact, express contrary opinions to the people who made it. Uh, again, not to pick on you, just happened to be uh, recent and uh, isn't about Lambda. So Blenderbot was put online recently and immediately it was giving opinions about Zuckerberg's uh, handling of the company and various AI ethics issues. The main question is whether or not we are going to actually um, interact with these systems at face value. So to give a, another concrete example, there are companies building AI for uh, romantic and sexual purposes currently. Do we have to care about the consent of these systems that we are building for that explicit purpose. If an AI says no, does it mean no? It's a really profound and important point. Jihao, do you think that that's, what's your reaction to these points? I just want to get your take on it. I guess, so, but like, you know, my reaction um, is sort of, uh, well, first of all, there are lots of points I hadn't considered. Like for example, Blake's uh, final point about, especially this romantic, sexual consent with AI. That's very interesting. Um, other than that, um, I suppose my first reaction to that would be uh, this is something which, um, from what I'm hearing, especially Dex's point about the monkey, um, if I have this correct, Dex, your, your point was mainly that, oh, we haven't figured out like with animals, um, so it might be difficult to, to think about AI. Mm -hmm. um, do you think we should be having those conversations then? Uh, I absolutely do think these are conversations worth having. Um, you know, uh, obviously we could have a debate about, um, you know, whether Google's AI was sentient or not. And, you know, I think there's um, different points of view there. Um, but certainly, you know, it is a conceivable thing at some point in the future, um, if not now, that we will have AI that could achieve um, consciousness or something that people... Um, perceive as being conscious. Um, and <laughs> I, I think you could argue we've, we've reached that point. Um, and when we get to that um, point, you know, obviously it will be an incredibly intense debate. It will be something that, um, that it will be a very polarized debate, I'm sure. And the more we can invest in starting to have those kinds of conversations now about far flung futures that may not actually be that far flung, I think um, the better we will be off as a society. Um, these aren't conversations that can be held just by a very small set of people. I totally concede Blake's point, which is in the absence of having that kind of conversation or any sort of mechanism for driving these conversations at a societal level, we are sort of by default leaving it to a small set of uh, folks in the tech industry. And these are, these are things that are too consequential to be left to the tech industry. Um, these aren't things that the tech industry can figure out alone. Um, and that's also, by the way, why, for example, you know, the organization I work with, the um, oversight board, you know, our whole model is about introducing independent oversight of a small sliver of uh, content moderation decisions on social media. That's an area where we already know and have seen um, the value of having that kind of independent oversight, having that on these other kinds of debates where we're dealing with things which would really change our view of humanity and reality in a big way. I think that's a good thing. If you're joining us, welcome. This is Doha Debates on Twitter Spaces. I'm your host, Nadefa Hedayat. We're talking about artificial intelligence and asking, are we getting it right when it comes to developing AI in an ethical way? Blake Lemoyne and Dex Santatoric join me. But to some of your tweets, um, thank you so much for engaging with us. I'm, I'm pleased to see that this is something that you guys are finding interesting. Pan says, I'm more interested in the concept of AI literacy at elementary school or college level. I'm worried about adding AI as an aspect of infrastructure and see it safe for usage in human AI pairing and partnership. We need to understand the dynamics of symbiotic ideation studies. I think I barely understand what that means. Very good point though, Pan. Uh, M. Wright, Mikhail Wright says, is AI being weaponized in social media to promote certain agendas and a political preference? Dr. Asma says, how does it impact women? Crimes against women are increasing, especially cyber crimes. This is noticed in lockdown. So specifically trying to understand how um, sort of marginalized groups are affected by this. Remember, the central question we're trying to answer, hopefully in the next 15 minutes as we round off another portion of our discussion, is are we getting it right 
To that, I want to come to another speaker, um, Reem. I think you're in Iraq right now. Um, thank you so much for joining us. You're another Doha Debates Ambassador. Go ahead and ask your question and tell me who you want to answer first. I'm just going to wait a quick second to see if Reem's going to join us. Um, Reem, if you are there or if you do come online, let me know and I'll add you in as, much, as quickly as I can. But I've got a, a quick yes or no question for you, Dex and Blake. Um, do you believe that we already have human-like or non-human um, consciousness in existence right now? Just a very quick question, Dex. Um, no, I don't. Blake? Yes. And, the, I mean, you two are both here because you're you're very learned in your understanding of this. And to an extent, you both have skin in the game. Dex, you're part of an oversight committee that monitors or tries to regulate or ensure the safety of an entire swathe of people who use social media informed by AI. Blake, you got sacked for speaking your mind and um, noticing something that you think the public should know. In a way, you two both are doing public good, but you disagree fundamentally on this core tenant um, of, of what we're trying to talk about. So how do we reconcile those two differences in your perspectives? I'd love to engage you both on that as we wait for Reem to come online. Um, well, if, uh, I'll, I'll jump in. Um... You know, I think the answer is transparency. I think that's that's the piece where Blake and I very much agree. Um, look, I think both of us look at AI and the debates around these um, inventions in different ways, and we have different experiences, and we disagree um, on on this question about whether there is a a, a human like entity or or AI with consciousness. And the only way we're going to get to the bottom of it is through scrutiny and understanding and dialogue with a lot of different experts. It is something where we have to introduce daylight where there isn't currently daylight. And um, transparency is not some um, you know, fuzzy sentimental you know, thing. It's not an aspirational term. It is something that can be built in with real mechanisms. It is something that can be um, driven with a regulatory framework. Um, it is a, a thing that companies can live up to in terms of their corporate responsibility. And so I think I think that's the answer. Honestly, it's not a thing that can be resolved just by um, you know either Blake or I um, changing our point of view. It's something that where a lot of people need to see evidence on a whole host of things, and over time understand what is it we we're really looking at. Blake, I'd love to invite you to speak on that. Oh sure. Um, well, one, I think the players that are trying to develop these systems are trying to have it both ways. They're trying to develop systems that will be perceived as human and perceived as conscious and think that they aren't. Um, if they want to have it one way or the other, they need to have some kind of um, plan in place because the purpose of developing a system that can have a conversation with you uh, is to have human-like interaction. The I, I agree that neither Dex or my opinion is going to change anything, uh, but the main difference, I think, is that I have a bar that I was using, um, specifically the Turing test. We have a system that can pass the Turing test now. Um, so given that I have as much evidence that that system is conscious and sentient as I have that Dex is conscious and sentient, um, that's the bar I'm using. Most of the people who are saying, nope, we're not there yet, aren't providing what bar they're waiting for. They're just kind of saying, nope, nothing to see here, move along. And I believe that would be what we need to agree on, not whether or not an existing system uh, is conscious or sufficiently human-like to require ethical consideration, but at what point would we think that? Mm. Thank you both for answering that. Reem, you're joining us from Iraq. Tell us um, what your question is. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, Ms. Nagufar, Mr. Dex, and Mr. Blake, I'm so happy and thankful for this opportunity. 
Um, as I concluded from your speech, both gentlemen, is that AI should be used and uh, developed in a way that is ethical and commu community slash uh, society friendly. And uh, since I'm uh, like most of the people, it, very fascinated with the power and the magic of AI. Um, however, um, in a country, I live in a country that is very far away from all these developments. And uh, my country is very hit with uh, climate change. I can't but think about it. So, I'm not sure if you can hear Reem. Dex, Blake, can you hear Reem? Yep, I Dex. can hear Reem. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, should I continue? Yes, yes, please. Okay, so um, going further. So my country is very hurt by climate change and I can but help but think about it. So my question for you, gentlemen, is um, how can we develop AI in a way that can reduce and not worsen climate change? Uh, thank you so much, and I'm done speaking. Let's go to you first, Blake, if that's all right. Yeah, uh, so AI can help us solve any problem that a sufficiently smart person thinking for long enough could solve on their own. One of the problems with questions about how can AI help us solve climate change is that we already know what the answer on how to reverse climate change is. We need to be burning less fossil fuels, engaging in carbon capture activities, whether that be uh, artificial or simply planting more trees, and we need to be consuming less energy. Um, the fact is we just don't wanna do it. AI can't help us solve any problems where we already have the answer and simply don't want to do it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's spot on, right? Um, we're not going to get a technological solution to um, societal challenges where we have a vacuum of leadership. And there is a, a huge vacuum of leadership um, on climate change right now, both um, in most countries around the world and internationally. Um, AI is something that is an incredibly powerful tool for collaboration, for innovation, for interpreting and harnessing the power of data, um, that is something, if it is connected to the right ends, um, then, yeah, it can probably be used in a lot of different ways. It, it is already being used in a lot of different ways, um, which will have an impact on the fight against climate change. But it is something that will require leaders and entrepreneurs and companies to really um, understand and prioritize um, as, as a focus for AI and um, you know, this is something that in spite of, you know, obviously the huge changes in public opinion over the last few years, and the fact that I think the majority of the world's population now recognizes um, that climate change is an urgent societal problem, we still have incredibly sluggish action. So I, I guess the question will be, can we convince enough leaders in time to put AI to work in tackling this problem? Reem, I'd love to get your reaction to that. I think this is very insightful, uh, but I believe that my country is very far away from all these developments. And I wish that one day we can really use the technology that is uh, being developed to actually tackle the problems in my country and other poor countries. Uh, because as I've noticed, uh, the Western countries are getting uh, more focused while their climates are um, getting better and better. And I hope they can share the education and the information they've reached with us. Thank you so much, Reem. Um, as we round off this conversation, we've only got just a few more minutes to go. This is definitely um, a global conversation and a global issue. And I'm so pleased that we got people here um, contributing from different places in the world with different priorities. If you've missed this Doha Debates on Twitter Spaces and you want to listen back to the full recording, you will be able to do that on our Twitter page as soon as this stream is ended in the next few minutes. We encourage you to listen to the, to the debate um, and to let us know what you think. Now, usually, Blake and Dex, I end this, um, this conversation by asking you if you can find one single thing in the other person's position that you might agree with or might have made you pause we don't need that because you have both expressed the nuance 
that we all need to take on board as we discuss AI and figure out who's getting it right and wrong. So I just want to leave maybe the last couple of comments to the both of you to maybe ask each other a question or maybe comment on the other person's position in a way that has increased your understanding. And Blake, I'm going to let you do that first. And Dex, you can you can wrap things up for us. Oh, sure. I'll go ahead and pose the question that I was just hypothetically saying. So Dex, at what point would you consider AI conscious and um, a person? I don't think um, I have a <laughs> off the shelf set of criteria. I think it's something that we're only going to understand through a lot of scrutiny from a lot of people from within the industry and outside of it. I don't think it's going to be a thing um, where we cross a single threshold um, and we say, aha, that's the moment we've reached consciousness. Um, I think it's going to be something where it's going to be a gradual uncovering of understanding of the capabilities that are at stake there. Um, in terms of my question, actually, maybe this is a slightly different angle, but I'm just really interested, Blake, what's next for you? Um, obviously, um, you've taken a very public, um, you know, strong stand on issues around um, transparency and accountability and, and how AI is developed. I'm really interested, just personally, like what's, what's next for you and how are you thinking about continuing to shape um, the debates around these technologies? Yeah, well, so um, it turns out that adding transparency around AI uh, makes you a somewhat uh, suboptimal hire in Silicon Valley. Um, several companies that were very interested in hiring me a year ago are no longer interested at all, uh, including Facebook. The main options I'm left with are starting my own company are public education. And right now I'm pursuing both in parallel. Either the system's working because you were able to do what you did or it's broken because you can no longer get a job doing what you did. These are really important perspectives and points. And I am deeply grateful to you both, um, Dex Hunter-Torek and Blake Lemoyne for increasing our understanding and helping us make this a little more um, of a nuanced conversation. A big thank you to you both. And thank you to our audience. We're gonna be back in about two weeks time with a debate on wealth inequality. While you wait, you can check out some of our other content. You can listen to the latest episode of my podcast, Course Correction, and our new season of The Negotiators coming out on September 27th. You can go to our YouTube page and watch our full debates, which are lively, dynamic, and brilliant. Um, we have one there, in fact, featuring Dex, um, that you can watch on the future of AI. It's brilliant. I recommend it. Visit our website. We are dohardebates.com to sign up to our newsletter and so, so much more.